Oh, that was awesome. All right, put your hand in your heart. Say, Heavenly Father, give me a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you. Give me eyes to see and ears to hear and a heart of understanding. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, this is going to be our final uh, message in Ephesians. How many of you enjoyed Ephesians? Has it been a powerful, powerful study? I think this is our sixth one, but um, it's been a few weeks. We had kind of an intermission, a little brief intermission, um, but my wife did an amazing job on the last one, kicking it off with Ephesians 5. And I know Apostle Tom's message was powerful last week. Um, so let's jump in. Uh, who, who has not been here for the whole Ephesians series? Raise your hand. Okay. Who's, who's only, have you guys been to any of them? No? Okay. All right. Well, we'll do a, a quick recap of, of everything we've kind of covered. Also, just to refresh us since we have taken a couple weeks off uh, from this. But um, the book of Ephesians is, ha, has in the past been and has reaffirmed to be one of my favorite books of the Bible as we've done this study. Um, but it, it, it was the Apostle Paul that wrote this epistle, this letter to the believers, to the saints in Ephesus. And uh, we talked about in the first week, Ephesus uh, was, a, 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 it was a Gentile city and it, they had the greatest revival really in the New Testament. You see the greatest move of God, the greatest work of God in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 19, in Ephesus. And Paul was there for two years preaching the word of God, just going for it. This is where it says unusual miracles were worked by the hands of, of Paul. So much so that aprons were taken from his body and, and, and just laid over the sick and they were healed. And the lame walked and, and demons were cast out just by waving a, an apron off of Paul's body. Um, that's pretty wild. <laughs> that's, that's, that's awesome. Uh, unusual miracles and signs and wonders. But Paul was there for two years just bringing the kingdom and just taking out strongholds of the enemy and es establishing the kingdom in a people. And Paul comes to this moment where... He's like, okay, I got, I got another assignment. It's time for me to, to take off and uh, I'm going. And by the way, you're never going to see my face again. And he, he says goodbye to the, the elders of the church and, and to the church. And it says that they, they wept sorrowfully over the words that he said that they would never see his face again. And so now Paul is in prison. In fact, people tried to warn him like, no, because he said, I'm going to Jerusalem because I've got to testify of the Lord Jesus. And they're like, no, don't go, because, because you're basically going to die. And he's like, what would, what would keep me from, from that? Like, that's my reward. Like, why would I not go and suffer for his name? That was his response. And, and they're just like, okay. <laughs> this guy's like crazy, you know, to live is Christ, to die is gain. In fact, literally while he was in Ephesus, Paul was stoned to death. It says that he, they drug his body outside the city and then the believers gathered around him and prayed and he was raised back. And then he goes into the city and preaches again to the same people that just stoned him. <laughs> like Paul was sold out, man. This guy was all in. And <laughs> I just, I love those stories. I'm like, man, this guy sets the bar really high for following Jesus. <laughs> So, so he's like, I'm going to Jerusalem. Well, of course, as the story goes, he was arrested, put in prison. And, uh, and so Paul's in prison and he starts writing all these letters to the different churches that he planted and fathered. And he's, he's continuing to minister to them through writing letters. And that's how we got the, the book of Ephesians. It's Paul's in prison writing this letter. And, and it's a pretty phenomenal letter to be written from the prison. <laughs> Like, I, you probably think, you know, if you're in prison, you might be writing letters like, please pray for me. 
Pray that I get out of here soon. Send resources. Help me. <laughs> you know, like, don't forget me. <laughs> I'm over here in prison. It's rotting away. And that's not what Paul talks about at all. He draws all their attention unto the Lord and the, the, the magnitude of what he's done. And so that's just really powerful. So we went through the chapter one is really just expounding upon the mystery of our faith and the, the beauty of the gospel. Uh, chapter two, we talked about chapter one through three. It really is just who you are in Christ because of what Christ has done. It's, it's expounding upon your identity, the, the wonderful grace of God uh, lavished upon you, as he says in chapter one. And then chapters four through six is really how you should live because of who you are. It's like, you know, a good tree bears good fruit, right? A bad tree bears bad fruit. So he's, he's saying, listen, you, you now are a new creation. You, 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 all these things that Christ has done for you, who you are because of him, it should bear fruit in your life. And this is what it looks like. And that's what chapters four through six is really all about is what your life ought to look like because of who you are in Christ. Does that make sense? So, um, that is where we, we left off in Ephesians 5, about halfway through it. And that's part of where I'm going to be, be picking up today. But I just wanted to remind us of some of these gospel truths found in Ephesians 1. Um, I was just blessed. Yet last night I was preparing for this and, and I just, the Lord just really blessed me when I was rereading Ephesians 1. But, um, man just like, where do, where do you start? <laughs> um, you know, it says, blessed and worthy of praise be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms in Christ. I, I heard someone say, you know, he's, he's referred to as the God and Father of our Lord Jesus. And that the fact that he's, Jesus is God, refers to Jesus as our mediator. You know, he mediates between the Father and us on our behalf. The new covenant, when it was ratified in his blood. Old covenant, Moses mediated between God and the people. But Jesus is our mediator. So for him to be the God of Christ means Christ is our mediator. But Christ is also God. And as God, God is his father. And the, 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 the wonder of our union with Christ is the fact that because we've been joined to him, his God and father is our God and father. And we get to relate to the father the way the son does because of the son. This is a mystery. This is profound. We get to relate to the father the way the son does. Because of what the son has done. He says no longer in John chapter 20, 21, when he raises from the dead. He says, go to my brethren and tell them that I am ascending to my God and their God, to my father and their father. So he has united us to himself so that he can be in us, Christ in us, the hope of glory. And what did he say in John 17? As the Father has loved me, so he has loved you. Think about that. The way the Father, think, think about this. This is crazy. He goes on and he talks about how he chose us before the foundation of the world in him. So before anything ever existed, when it was just the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, think about the perfect unity, the eternal holiness, and the glory that they shared together, and the love that they exchanged one to another. The eternal love of God, the love that the Father has for the Son, and the Son for the Father. And Jesus says this, the way the Father has loved me, so he has also loved you. What? He takes us and puts us in himself so that we can be grafted into the divine nature. And partakers of Christ, partakers of his glory, partakers of his kingdom. That's crazy. 
<laughs> That's amazing. Why? Because ultimately God wants to be all in all. He wants everything that has come from him to be in him so that all things would manifest him. And that's what Apostle Cato was getting at. That, that our lives are to manifest Christ. We're supposed to reveal him and to make him known. Isn't that powerful? I just, man, this is amazing. The, when it says, it says this. Let me find it. In a, verse 11, the second half. It says, the beginning of it says, we've received an inheritance by God, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works everything in agreement with the counsel of his will, the counsel and design of his will. And what one of the things I got from that is, is God has a vision. God has a goal. God has something that he's after. And he is not going to be wavered from or deviate from his ultimate desire, plan, and intention. And that is to have a family, a people for himself of sons and daughters that are also collectively a bride for his son. And he, in, 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 in despite the fact that we would become sinful, corrupt people, he, he will not change his mind that he has purposed from before the foundation of the world to make us holy as he is holy. Like, there is nothing that can, you can do to change the counsel and will of God for your life. <laughs> That's crazy. That's amazing. He has absolutely purposed when it says this. Let me read it. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world so that we would be holy and blameless in his sight. Not because he didn't cho chose a, choose us because we would be holy. He chose us and determined, despite what we would do, to make us holy. And he has guaranteed that we will be holy by putting his spirit in us to begin the work of holiness. Anyone ever been into like restoring old cars or seen people that do? You know, there's, there's some pretty amazing mechanics out there. And to be honest, this doesn't even compare to what Christ does for us. But you, they, you, people can take some of the oldest, most beat up, broken down cars and make everything about them down to every last nut and bolt just brand new and make it like the most beautiful masterpiece. The Lord is, is set on making us what he's intended us to be from the beginning. And it he will bring it about. <laughs> I'm just like, thank you, Lord. <laughs> thank you, Lord. So that, I just wanted to review that because that really is then the plumb line for this whole, this whole book of the, the eternal will and counsel of God bringing about complete redemption for all creation through his son. This is the, the plumb line, the vision that God has and his will and intent that is set that will never be moved or changed. And it's, it, it, I just am I'm amazed at the, the wisdom of God that he is able to take a world like the one we live in and make it like a new Eden and a new Jerusalem. It's going to happen. It doesn't matter if you agree with it. It's going to happen. <laughs> There's nothing you can do to stop it. It's going to happen. The difference is, is whether you will partake of it like the children of Israel who didn't enter the, the new land, the promised land because of unbelief, or whether we'll believe God for his promises and enter in and partake of that and receive the inheritance. And I don't mean that, you know, that you won't receive eternal salvation. I'm talking about experiencing the kingdom now and continuing to see his purpose advanced in the earth now because our eternal dwelling place will be here <laughs> He's bringing the kingdom down so that earth is like heaven. And when you're on the earth, it should be difficult, like in Eden, to discover, am I in heaven or am I on earth? I'm on earth. Wait, I'm in heaven because they're one. You're going to see cherubim and angelic beings in the throne of God, but there's also trees and there's a river of life. And there's all why? Because heaven and earth are one. This is the intent that God is going to bring about. The difference is, is how many generations it will take 
Or are we going to be the generation that believes him and obeys his voice and enters into promises and sees, th sees things that past generations never saw? Come on, somebody. And he's given you everything you need. In fact, this, the spirit himself is the down payment of those things. When you, when you go to buy a house, you make a down payment. It's not the full payment of what it will cost, but it's the beginning and it guarantees the rest. That's what the spirit is in us. So he made us alive when we were dead. I'll read this verse in Ephesians 2 because it was so powerful and it goes right with what Apostle Katie was sharing. But it says, it says, you were dead. Amen. <laughs> no, amen. It doesn't stop there. You, he made alive when you were dead and separated from him because of your transgressions and sins in which you once walked. You were following the ways of this world influenced by this present age in accordance with the prince and the power of the air. The spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. The enemy, right? Imagine an atmosphere where there, is, there, there isn't the enemy's influence. That's when the ruling power of heaven, the only influence is the Holy Spirit Earth begins to look like heaven. So for us to taste heaven here now, we have to diligently guard our minds from the accuser of the brethren. Amen? And this is just so powerful. This goes on. It, 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 he ends Ephesians 1 expounding upon the fact that Christ has been seated in the place of victory far above every power, principality, and spiritual host of wickedness. Far above, like so far above that you, you probably couldn't even see them beneath you. Far above. He's been placed far above these things. He has all authority and all power over every other power, and he lives in you. And his authority and power now emanate from his people. This is amazing. So he says in Ephesians 3, verse 10, that through the church... Anybody in here part of the church? Through the church, the multifaceted wisdom of God in all its countless aspects might now be made known, revealing the mystery to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. The church, the people that are inhabited by Christ, in whom Christ dwells, the one who's seated far above every power and principality is now to make known the wisdom of God to those powers and principalities. So then when you get to Ephesians 6, and he talks about, therefore, put on the whole armor of God, because we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but powers and principalities. You recognize, oh, wait a minute, there's a theme through this whole book about the believer's identity in Christ and Christ's destroying the works of the enemy through his people. Come on, somebody. So, now I want to point something out. We, we, we've, we've made it to where we're going to begin. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, in Ephesians 5, he, he, he goes in on how wives relate to their husbands, how husbands relate to their wives, Marriage, right? And then he, the next one, Ephesians 6, 1, he talks about how children relate to their parents and how fathers relate to their children. And then he talks about how slaves relate to their masters and masters to their slaves. Now, sometimes we can read that and think, well, you know, that doesn't really apply to us. Well, let me put it in a relatable language. And, and you should read these scriptures and apply it in this manner. Employees relate to your employers and employers relate to your employees like this. So, so he lays out marriage, children, work. These are building blocks of society. And he says, if you relate to one another this way, you're going to look like Christ in the earth. 
Well, it's, it's what he builds up to then putting on the armor of God. Why? Because you're going to need to abide in Christ to properly relate to other people. Does that make sense? That's exactly what Apostle Cato was talking about. <laughs> you're going to need to guard your mind. You're going to need to be built up in your faith. And, and just like God has purposed and intended with an end result, we have to purpose and intend to keep our love on, to walk humbly, to walk mercifully, to give allowance for each other's faults, as he says in chapter 4, to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. But I want to share this. A, a Greek mind, the way the, the Greeks thought, they measured their maturity by how much they knew. The, the extent of knowledge determined your maturity to the Greeks. But a Hebrew mind measures maturity by how you relate to other people. Your ability to successfully relate to other people is the measure, measuring rod, so to speak, of your maturity. So I wrote this down. Your, your, your character is determined by your ability to relate to others. And how you relate to both God and others is the measuring rod of your stature in Christ. Your ability to successfully relate to your spouse, to your children, to your parents, to your employer, to your employees, to people in general, that is the measuring rod of your, your level in Christ, your stature, your maturity. In the natural... You know, when I was growing up, my parents, would, they would always mark my height. They're measuring my stature, right, in the natural. Well, in the same way, we should be able to measure our stature and see that we're continuing to grow and becoming more and more like Christ because of how we can relate successfully according to his word and his command, right? Come on, somebody. That's a good word. Y'all are quiet this morning. <laughs> so, in uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22, he says, Wives, be subject to your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is head of the church, himself being the Savior of the body. Now, I want to expand a little bit about Man, your role in the family, your role as a husband, as the head of your wife, okay? Um, headship is symbolic of being the seat of wisdom, reason, and knowledge, right? The head, that's where your, your cognitive ability to think and to lead comes from. So, but I, I want to I shift the imagery for a second because man is the foundation of the family, so we, we read headship and we think, you know, everything's like a hierarchy. Now, that is using that imagery, but if you look at a house, what's the first thing that is built? The foundation. Without a man, I'm just being biblical today, <laughs> a man, a family cannot be complete. Without a wife, a family cannot be complete. Nobody lays two foundations you put walls up next. Nobody builds just walls. You lay a foundation first. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's true. You lay a foundation first, right? So men, your job as the head of your wife is to be the foundation for her life. And I'll never forget what Apostle Tom told me. It was in a message he did, actually. Everyone should go back and watch it. It's called The Covenant Marriage. It's on YouTube. But he said, he said, you can always tell the condition of a man's soul by how well his wife is flourishing. I'm like, <laughs> that brings some accountability. <laughs> you have a job to do to cultivate the garden of your wife's heart. I'm still working on that. Okay, but I think my wife's doing pretty well, so, you know. <laughs> so, it says this. He uses the, he, he compares the husband all the way to Christ as Savior. 
Husband is head of the wife, as Christ is head of the church, himself being the savior of the body. The point of Jesus being savior, he rescues us from evil and he provides us with all of his, you know, the good things of the kingdom and his blessings. So man, our job is to protect our wives and our children from dangers, from evils, and to provide, right? We're to be providers. So in the same way that Christ, in a sense, brings his people out of darkness into light, we're to make sure that we establish that in our homes. And if it's not, realize that God ex- holds us responsibility for the spiritual atmosphere of our homes, both natural and spiritual. That's the truth. When there's chaos in a home, the first person God looks at is the man. You're the foundation. If the house is sliding off the hill, guess whose fault it is? The foundation. Is that okay? (laughs) Think about this. When Adam and Eve were in the garden... Eve took of the tree. Nothing happened. She ate the fruit. Nothing happened. But when she went to the foundation, then the fall of man came. Man was supposed to say, no, 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 honey. That's not how we do it in this house. To guard his wife's mind and to show her the way of the Lord. So men, take your place in your house and in society because man is the cornerstone the building block of society so we might think well God's not into society transformation he's just into family well family is the building blocks of society so if you change a family you change a neighborhood you change a neighborhood you change a city you change a city you change a nation come on somebody I'm going to quote, I want to quote somebody, okay? There's a new movie that just came out. I don't think this was in the movie, but this is something that Ronald Reagan said, and it was really powerful. He said, all great change in America begins at the dinner table. That's a man that knows the Bible. (laughs) All great change in America begins at the dinner table. I'm stealing that. You can now quote me. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) That was Ronald Reagan. That's so powerful. Family is the foundation of society. Come on. Just to to, to see the the order of God. Let's look at this in 1 Corinthians 11. This is so powerful. Verse 7, it says, A man ought not have his head covered, since he is the image and reflected glory of God. But the woman is the expression of man's glory. For man does not originate from woman, but woman from man. Or indeed, man was not created for the sake of woman, but woman for the sake of man. Therefore, the woman ought to have a sign of authority on her head for the sake of the angels. Nevertheless, woman is not independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. For as the woman originates from the man, so also the man is born through the woman. And all things originate from God as their creator. So the whole point of that, by the way, is just that the woman ought to have her head covered, which he says also is the man is her covering because he's her head. So, and he says that her hair is given to her for covering. So ladies, you have hair, you're covered. (laughs) If you're married, submit to your husband, you're covered. (laughs) Don't shave it. Don't shave it. In the Old Testament, the Lord said he didn't like it when people shaved their heads. So, <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> so the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also wives should be subject to their husbands in everything, respecting both their position, this is the Amplified, position as protector and their responsibility to God, as head of the house. Now, in light of your responsibility, men, the duty of husbands is to love their wives without which they will abuse their headship. Love your wives 
Seek the highest good for her and surround her with caring, unselfish love, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify the church, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word of God, so that in turn he might present the church to himself in glorious splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy, set apart for God and blameless. Even so, husbands should and are morally obligated to love their own wives as being in a sense their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own body, but instead he nourishes and protects and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. That's so powerful. You can get so much revelation just about Jesus from that. One point is when it says he, Christ gave himself so that he might present the church to himself, which right there you see the law of sowing and reaping in your life. So back to what Apostle Tom told me, what I sow into my wife, what I, how I serve my wife, how I love my wife, there should be a cause and effect of that. And it should cause her to be glorious and spotless and wonderful and all of those things. Husbands, just making you accountable. Now you know. <laughs> it's awfully quiet in here. <laughs> but you can see this, that Christ endues the members of his body with a principle of holiness so that he might deliver them from the guilt, the pollution, and the dominion of sin from everything that would cause you to be not beautiful, not wonderful, not glorious. All right, Ephesians chapter 6. So again, he starts off with the foundation of society, man and woman. The original institution that God ordained was in Genesis, and it was called the family. So children, this is next on the list, obey your parents in the Lord. That is Accept their guidance and discipline as his representatives. So I want you to, to catch this. Parents, as Adam and Eve were the image and likeness of God in the earth, so you are the image and likeness of God to your children. You are the direct representation of God. The, you're supposed to be, as Jesus is, the visible image of the invisible God. You're supposed to be a visible representation of what God is like. This is our role. This is our responsibility is to properly and adequately represent him first and foremost in the home. I think it was, uh, you know, where's, where's, where's Todd? You know the man. Who's the guy? You, 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 Jim Elliott, right? Or is that his name? He said, he's the missionary that you liked, right? He was, he was, he was a martyr. Um, Jim Elliott said this, the light that shines the farthest shines the brightest at home. So if we want to be the light of the world, well, we better know how to be the light of our home. In fact, Jesus said, who lights a light in their house and puts a, a basket over it? Can the light that you have for Christ be seen first in your family? This is so good. I just love the word of God. Come on. Okay. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. Where's, where's any children out in here? Or you're still under your parents, under your parents' roof? Come on. Honor your mother. Listen to her. She has your best in mind. It's for your good. This is right. I love this, this verse in, in the Amplified. It says, this is right for obedience. This is a word for me as a child of God. We need to obey his voice. Obedience teaches wisdom and self-discipline. So honor, esteem, treat as valuable and precious your father and your mother and be respectful to them. This is the first commandment with a promise so that it may be well with you and that you may have a long life on the earth. <clears throat> fathers, now it gives a word to fathers. Do not provoke your children to anger, 
Do not exasperate them to the point of resentment with demands that are trivial or unreasonable or humiliating or abusive, nor by showing favoritism or indifference to any of them. But bring them up tenderly with loving kindness in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And then he goes on to slaves and masters. Let's keep reading. I want to touch on that. In the discipline and instruction of the Lord. I really think that if I'll I'll speak to myself as a, a new father, if I can adequately teach my children or, or demonstrate to them the discipline of the Lord. Then when they leave my roof, they'll recognize it when it comes. They'll recognize the discipline of the Lord because they've seen it their whole life. It was properly displayed. It was properly shown. So in the same way that Jesus came and first as a man made disciples. Uh, I've had this, this thought so many times. How, how could they follow a spirit that they can't see if they couldn't follow a man that they can see? First John says, how can you love a God that you can't see if you can't love your brother whom you can see? So they had to first learn. They had to first be disciplined. They had to first watch and see with a visible representation so that when he left and their time had come, they were able to recognize the one who was just like him in the person of Holy Spirit. So we're just training our children so that they can be fathered by the father as we represent him. Tenderly, with loving kindness, bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord so that they would know him, so that our children would know him. Slaves, be obedient. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hyphenate it. Employees, be obedient to those who are your employers, your earthly masters, with respect for authority and with a sincere heart, seeking to please them. As service to Christ, not in the way of eye service, working only when someone watches you or only to please men, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart, rendering service with goodwill as to the Lord and not only to men, knowing that whatever good thing each one does, he will receive this back from the Lord, whether he is slave or free. I think of Colossians 3, which says, it says, in whatever you do, whether word or deed, do it as unto the Lord and not for people. Meaning when you see your boss, who's a, an authority figure in your life. Well, the Bible says he's a, a representation of God's authority in your life. The way you re, 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 relate to your, remember maturity, your ability to successfully relate. The way you relate to someone with the character of Christ or the lack of his character The Lord basically says, well, then that's how you treat me. He takes it personally. It's as it's as if you did it to him. So Jesus said this, if men reject you, then they reject me. But if men accept you, then they accept me. What's the point? The way we treat his leaders, the way the world treats the church is the way they treat God. The way people treat his people God takes it personally. He says, if you want to, you know, this principle is all throughout scripture. In the Old Testament, if you want to bless God, then you bless the priest. The Lord takes it personally as his direct representatives. This is just the Bible. It sets you free, man. I'm telling you, there's so much freedom. When I was in the military, I loved going to work every day. I did. It was like I had so much fun. I loved it. And I was so excited every day, not before I got saved. (laughs) But when I got saved, man, I was excited. I got assigned different projects to do, and I just just doing it. Why? Because I know that ultimately the one who's watching me is not my commander. It's the Lord, the commander of angel armies. And he's like, he's like, you know, if you're faithful with little, then I'll trust you with much. And he's watching. He's watching. That's a good word. We'll keep reading. 
So here's a word to employers. You masters, do the same, showing goodwill towards them. Give up threatening and abusive words, knowing that he who is both their true master and yours is in heaven and that there is no partiality with him, regardless of one's earthly status. Now, in conclusion, here's the conclusion of all of this. The instructions on how to successfully relate to one another in love, honor, humility. He says, be strong in the Lord, meaning... When it's difficult to do these things, rely upon him to strengthen you to do them. When it's hard to honor an employer, when it's hard to, to when, you, when you feel like your flesh is telling you just be lazy. Lord, I need grace. Strengthen me. Draw your strength from him. Right? So when, when we read in Ephesians chapter 3, he says, Paul says that he, he, he bows before the Father. Why? So that he would grant us from the riches of his glory to be strengthened and spiritually energized with power through his spirit in our inner man. So that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith and that we would be rooted and grounded in love. Listen, if you're rooted and grounded in love, it ain't going to matter what anybody else does to you. Because you are secure in the love of God and you're free to love others regardless of if they love you back. That's called maturity. That's called the full stature of Christ. That's exactly what Apostle Katie said. We must be in the Spirit. <laughs> Literally, the character of Christ in the face of enemies and he wasn't shaken, he wasn't moved. We're all becoming that. We're all on a journey of becoming that. So if we're not that yet, that's not a reason for shame. That's not a reason for condemnation. That's a reason to, to recognize, oh, I have a goal now. I have something to pursue in growth to go after so that I can become more and more like Jesus. I now have a place where I can measure my growth. I now have something to bring before the Lord and say, Lord, I'm weak in this area. You have things to confess, things to... Listen, the Lord loves it when you just tell Him the truth. When you're just honest with Him, when you're real with Him, when you, you confess everything, you, you share your heart with Him. Sometimes we think like, you want to give your heart to the Lord and it's like, I got to make it perfect first. No, <laughs> He makes it perfect when you just give it to Him. Come on, somebody. So... I want to share something about the armor of God that I thought was really powerful. I'd never re really thought of this before uh, when I was studying this last night even. But um, how many of you know Apostle Tom's been doing a series on faith in Tacoma? He preached on faith last week. So check this out. One, all throughout, you know, he sets the plumb line in Ephesians 1 about the eternal plan of God, the eternal counsel and will and intent of God, Right? And, and God is focused on that. He's never going to deviate from it. And it's going to come to pass. In his sovereignty and his power over all things, he is working all things unto that end goal, right? So, so but that's what, that's, what, that's what faith does. Faith sees, and it says, I believe, and it presses on into the promises of God, the intent of God, right? So the first thing that man is supposed to to, to tighten and stand firm in it says to to tighten it and to to bind yourself with it is truth it's the word of god why because that's the foundation of your faith so then everything after that is building they're like building blocks the armor of god and the last one he says above all lift up the protective shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. So remember Ephesians 2? There's the prince of the power of the air. Well, when you stand firm on the word of God, which Jesus says is like a house built on rock, remember? And then in faith, you raise up your shield of faith, believing the promises of God. Your faith silences the power of the air. Come on, somebody. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Come on. Is that not powerful?
So every piece of armor is like, like building blocks. First, the, the, the word of truth. The, the, the having, having tightened wide the band of truth. Personal integrity, moral courage. And having put on the breastplate of righteousness and upright heart. And having strapped on your feet the gospel of peace in preparation to face the enemy with firm-footed stability and the readiness produced by the good news. Meaning, have the expectation of a fight, but do it knowing that you have the victory. And so as Apostle Katie shared with the, whole, with the political season, don't, don't partake of the political spirit of fear. Rather, engage it from the right place. And don't be intimidated by it. Come on. That's a good word. That's powerful. And having, yeah, to face the enemy with firm-footed stability and the readiness produced by the good news. I want to read one thing. Real quick, this is kind of a left field, but it ties in. I've been reading in Jeremiah, and this was profound. If I can find it. Lord, remind me, where is it? Listen to this. Jeremiah 1, 17. The Lord encounters Jeremiah, begins instructing him, begins leading him in, in his prophetic ministry and how how he is to speak on God's behalf to Israel. And he warns him multiple times to not be afraid. Verse 8 says, Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to protect you and deliver you. Why? Because he's like, by the way, the things you're going to say to them, they're going to want to kill you for. So, but don't be afraid of them. I am with you to protect you and deliver you. Now look at this, verse 17. But you, Jeremiah, gird up your loins in preparation. Isn't that what Paul just said? Gird your loins with the band of truth. He says, get up and tell them, speak all which I command you. Do not be distraught. Don't be intimidated. Don't bow down and cower in fear. And break down at the sight of their hostile faces. He says this, or I will bewilder you before them and allow you to be overcome by them. That is intense. Why? The Lord is calling people to a radical, bold faith that will not bow to the spirit of intimidation and unashamedly speak the truth. Come on, somebody. Why? So that you can overcome and quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. So he ends with now, in light of that, (laughs) <laughs> with all prayer and petition, pray with specific requests at all times, on every occasion and in every season, in the Spirit. And with this in view, stay alert with all perseverance and petition, interceding in prayer for all of God's people, and pray for me. I love that he says, you, you know, in, in, in view of this, with all prayer, with all petition, stay alert with all perseverance. Because it's going to require endurance. It's going to require you to endure, to persevere. To stay faithful in the place of prayer, which Apostle Katie said as well. This is a season to be in prayer. Come on, somebody. I I just, I I feel, it's like I feel just the faith. Like Caleb and Joshua, I'm like, yeah, the giants are our bread. Like, like, like. You've been guaranteed, read Ephesians 1. Like You have been guaranteed the victory. The Lord is with you. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. He's never going to change his mind about you. What he has in his mind to bring about in your life, he has promised. All you have to do is believe and trust him. And don't be afraid in the face of the enemy. This is so good. Pray for me. That words may be given to me when I open my mouth to proclaim boldly the mystery of the good news for which I am an ambassador in chains. Right? He was in prison. And pray that in proclaiming it, I may speak 
boldly and courageously as I should, just like the Lord said to Jeremiah. Now, so that you may know what I am doing. Now, this is how Paul closes this letter. And how he's going to continue to communicate with the believers in Ephesus through other servants of the gospel that are united with Paul and committed to the mission the Lord had given him. And he concludes with peace. Peace to the brothers and sisters and love joined with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Come on. Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus with undying and incorruptible love. And that is how he concludes the book of Ephesians. Will you stand with me? Can we have the ministry team come forward? In light of the gospel, the glorious gospel that he says in Ephesians 1, it says it's been, it's been, he showered the riches of his grace upon us. You know, all loving kindness and, and wisdom and understanding and mercy. And it says, in Christ, we have the treasures of redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our sins. God was so so intent, so committed to what he had planned from the beginning that he was willing to become a man and to let his life be taken for his blood to be shed so that he would bring about that end purpose. That's how committed he is to you. That's how he committed he is to his ultimate good will and purpose was that he was willing to shed his blood for it, which really is the pattern in scripture. Every person throughout scripture all, all these prophets, Jeremiah and many of them, they suffered tremendously. Why? Because they chose to join themselves to the plan of God and commit to it and to speak on his behalf. And, and that's how much God thinks every one of you. That's what he thinks of you. He thinks you're worth it. He thinks you're worth laying his life down. So I just want to give the opportunity that if anyone in here has not received Jesus Christ or isn't currently walking with him, maybe you're, you're a believer, but you're backslidden. You're like, you're like, I'm convicted today, and I want to I want to commit wholeheartedly. I want to, I want to, you know, burn the ships basically and no turning back. There's no going back. I just want to move forward in my, my walk with God. I want to move forward in my relationship with Christ. I want to give the opportunity to you. If you're like, yeah, that's me. I want to recommit my life to the Lord, or I want to give my life to the Lord. I want to receive the gift of salvation and the assurance of the forgiveness of my sins. Then I want to give that opportunity to you right now. Would, would you all close your eyes? And if that's you, if you're like, I want to give my life to the Lord for the first time, would you raise your hand? Come on. And then if you're the, the second group, if you're like, I, I, want to, I want to recommit my life to the Lord. I want to walk with him. I don't, want to, I don't want to be on the sidelines of the faith. I want to get in the game. And would, you, would you raise your hand? Come on. Or would you come forward to one of these amazing people at the front to pray with you? And, and the rest of you, let's pray right now. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your kingdom and for the gospel of our salvation through Jesus and the redemptive power, the redemptive work of his cross and the grace that you've given us through him. And so, Father, we just thank you right now for what you have for each and every person in this room, whether it be breakthrough, whether it be healing, whether it be deliverance. If you've been under an attack You'd say, I've been feeling just like intrusive thoughts. I've been feeling an attack on my mind. I, I think that, 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 that prince of the power of the air has been getting at me and you want to see that thing broken, then I want to invite you to come forward as well and let us pray for you. 
We want to we want to fight with you. We want to fight for you. We want to pray with you. And so if you're like, hey, I, I need some prayer. I need some help. And we would love to pray for you. The Lord wants to cover you. He wants to deliver you. He wants to heal you. He wants to protect you. And oftentimes, we need to look to one another to receive that. And so that's why we, we say, come forward and let us pray with you. Amen. Would you lift your hands? I want to pray a blessing. Heavenly Father, would you bless your people? Would you keep them? Keep them from the evil one, Lord, and sanctify them by the truth. Keep them from the evil one, Lord, and give them peace. Let the peace of God come upon every troubled heart, every disturbed mind. Let the peace of God come upon you. Father, may you give grace to your people and fill them with your spirit. May you make your face shine upon them and give them peace. Lift up your countenance upon them, Lord. I pray that you would draw them into a deeper place of intimacy with you, of abiding in you in this season, of treasuring your spirit and your word, and that you would continue the work of grace in every one of us, Lord. Healing hearts, breaking strongholds, and setting captives free. May your people flourish. Those who have planted themselves in the house of God, may you begin to cause them to flourish in this season. I thank you for a season of breakthrough. We thank you, Lord, for breaking through the enemy on our behalf. In Jesus' name, amen. Walk in the light. It's not just a brand. It's not a business strategy or a mission statement. It's a mandate from heaven. Jesus said, go into all the world. Preach the gospel. Make disciples. Love your neighbor. Instruct your children. Feed the hungry. Give water to the thirsty. Clothe the naked. Shelter the homeless. Heal the sick. Cast out demons. Walk in the light as he is in the light. So we bring the light. We bring wholeness wherever we go. We are ambassadors of joy, healing, justice, and reconciliation. We will bring the kingdom of heaven to the farthest corners and the darkest places until earth looks like heaven. Jesus said, go. And we say, yes. Thank you so much for watching Walk and Light International's video. If your heart is saying yes right now and you want to partner with us, you can do that through child sponsorship.
For just $35 a month, you can sponsor one of these amazing world changers. This provides for their school fees, health care, dental care, clean water, school lunch, and their discipleship. We have amazing pastors and amazing men and women of God that go through our school ministry that we raise up, and they're raising up these world changers. And for just $35 a month, which you can do today at our website, which is Whitley.com, that is W-I-T-L-I.com, you can go there today and say yes to one of these kids.